Um, so welcome everybody. Um, whenever uh, you want uh, your face to be seen, please feel free to turn on the cameras. We're in an intimate setting. Um, so we're going to be hoping to talk with everybody later on. Um, welcome to the third meeting in the series of Date with an Artist. Um, the series is a collaboration with the Austrian Cultural Forum in, in Israel, and I want to really thank them um, from the bottom of my heart for the ongoing uh, dialogue and their support and their understanding and their patience. And um, I see they're here with us, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and welcome to Ramesh Daha. Uh, Ramesh uh, is a Vienna-based artist uh, who will talk to us about her work. Uh, some of you know her. Um, but we will start. Oh, and also, just so you know, I have a date with an artist mug from which I'm drinking my coffee. Um, and we will start uh, with a 12-minute video uh, that Ramesh created especially for us for this event. And after that, we will talk. So I'm going to start with sharing the video. Nazi stormtroopers made other violent gestures. In 1933, together with sympathetic students, they organized public burnings of unsuitable books, particularly those by Jewish authors. When the Nazis rose to power in 1933, they wanted to purge evidence of Jewish life in Germany by changing the alphabet. Albert Anton, Änderung Ärger, Bernhard Bertha, Caesar Caesar, Charlotte Charlotte, David Dora, Emil Emil, Friedrich Fritz, Gustav Gustav, Heinrich Heinrich, Ida Ida. Jakob, Julius, Katharina, Konrad, Ludwig, Ludwig, Marie, Martha, Nathan, Nordpol, Otto, Otto, Ökonom, Oedipus, Paula, Paula, Quelle, Quelle, Richard, Richard, Samuel, Siegfried, Schule, Schule, Theodor, Theodor, Ulrich, Ulrich, Überfluss, Übel, Victor, Victor, Wilhelm, Wilhelm, Xantippe, Xantippe, Ypsilon, Ypern, Zacharias, Zeppelin. The end of the war didn't happen suddenly. It began prior to the First World War and continued after it had finished. A little over a month after the capitulation of the Nazi regime, my step-grandfather Leopold Klein, then age 22, wrote his short biography as follows. I was born on the 20th of September 1923 in Vienna as a son of a sheet metal worker's helper. Until the 13th of March 1938, my life was completely normal. My father was the branch helper in the main branch of Julius Meindl AG. Because of the prevailing unemployment at the time, he could not find a job in the area in which he was qualified. My mother, who was a qualified seamstress, contributed to the household finances by working at home. My parents and I led a very harmonious life. At the time, probably because of my age, I was not the slightest bit interested in politics. We led more or less quiet life than an average working family might lead. Then came the Brown invasion of the 13th of March 1938. How much suffering and tears have gone down as history of that day. All of a sudden, the quiet life was over for us. After 14 years of service and honest, hard work for the house of Meindl, my father, an Israelite by birth, was sacked. Not only that, after the Kristallnacht, even on the 10th of November, the assassination of Rat in Paris, and even though he had been baptized in 1921, my mother is an Aryan, 
he was taken to Dachau because of being a Jew by birth. After long imprisonment there, two and a half years, he was taken to Buchenwald and six months late to the concentration camp in Ravensbrück near Fürstenberg, where on the 17th of August 1942, death put an end to his four years of dreadful agony. As a first degree mixed blood, I was also removed from an apprentice position as sales trainee and then worked in a Jewish fabric shop until it was forced to close. Finally, in some hidden office of the Mindel concern, I was able to complete my business training. Unfortunately, some upper level Nazi found that my face didn't fit and proposed me to the organization Todd. However, my physical condition was not up to such demands. I had to cope with the result of the bad accident with a lift that almost cost me a foot. But the employment office did finally find me a worthy job as a laborer in a locomotive factory in Floridsdorf. My mother earned a relatively meager living as a seamstress. Dachau 14th of November 1938 to 27th of September 1939, 317 days, 21 letters. Dear Mitzi and Pauldi, have received card of 25th of November and the money. I am healthy. I cannot write this letter myself because I scalded the thumb fingers of my right hand carrying tea. I hope you went to Mindel on the last of the month. Go to Mr. Schmidt and ask him for a postponement. Do you have a lot to do? If you think about it, you could try to ask at Mindel for some work. My house keys are in my old trousers. I am not allowed to get Christmas parcels, but I can be sent money. Please write to my sister Rosa and ask if she can get some entry permit for me. Warm wishes and kisses to the relatives too. Your Sigi. I have my certificate of nationality and passport here with me. If you need them. Buchenwald, 27th of September 1939 to 14th of March 1942, 900 days, 32 letters. Dear Mitzi, I'm in Buchenwald. I'm fine and feeling well. If you don't get a letter from me for some time, don't worry. And don't write to the camp administration because that is not allowed. The card of the 13th of October and the 20 Reichsmark arrived. Thank you for that. You can write. Greetings from your father, Sigi. Ravensbrück, 14th of March 1942 to 17th of August 1942. 155 days, two letters. Dear Mitzi and Poldi, received your card of 15th of March and money, 12 Reichsmark, from the welfare. I inform you that I am well and happy to hear you are too. Please do not send any more money until I write. Don't worry if I don't write for some time. Warmest wishes to all, your grateful father, Sigi. German Embassy, Tehran. Tehran, 30th of April 1932. Subject, the Pahlavi regime. The Pahlavi regime has broken new ground in Persian politics, economics and culture and has reached stages that need to be assisted individually. On the whole, the work does not simply mean Europeanization. The weakness of the regime is that it stands on two eyes. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Political Archive, Berlin, Tehran 8, Volume 7, Persia to Iran, Berlin, 19th of February 1935. The Persian government has expressed the wish, starting with the first day of the Persian New Year, that is from 21st of March 1935, to designate their country no longer as Persia but as Iran, and also to name their population no longer Persians but Iranians.
17th of the 1314 in the Persian calendar. It was on this day that Reza Shah Pahlavi issued a ban on Islamic dress and chadors in Iran, forbidding the veil to be used by anyone, even forcibly removing them from those who resisted. At the graduation ceremony on this day, in a newly built college called Darwaz e Dolat, Reza Shah and his wife and daughters attended this ceremony for the first time unveiled in public. My grandmother Monijun was present as a graduating student. German Embassy Tehran, Tehran 2nd of July 1935. Now the Shah has also arranged that Iranian women take off the veil, dress European and appear in public in the company of their husbands. The Tehran Conference of 1943 was the first World War II conference involving the Big Three. Part of the conference was held in the American Embassy located on the street that was called 17th of Day, where my grandmother then lived. It was night. At the beginning of our street, we saw something huge. It was tanks, and there were five or six military men, at each one all wearing weapons and ready to shoot. Oh God, what is happening tonight? It was wartime. Everybody was worried in that street. In the morning, I woke up took my purse and went to see if I can leave the street or not. The soldiers allowed me to pass and they were still there when we returned. It wasn't until the following day that the newspaper announced that Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin were here right on our street in the American Embassy. The three had made negotiations. That night they dined with the Shah. At daybreak they left, so they would not be noticed. Three such important people, it could be dangerous. This became a historic event and the street was renamed Roosevelt Avenue since he was there. Thank you, uh, Ramesh. And uh, if somebody entered late and missed uh, some of the video, we will also upload it later. So don't worry. Um, and uh, Ramesh, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the two projects that uh, kind of um, incorporated into this video. Um, originally, uh, they are segments from two projects from the series Unlimited History, um, which are books that you created, um, but it's more than books. It's like sort of like a lifetime uh, archive and research. And it's related to the two branches of your family. Um, one is from Iran and the other is from Austria. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and also um, about your process and your way of thinking when you when you created these projects. First of all, thank you for the invitation and for the patience to look this dark video. <laughs> so um, actually, these are the books. That's the new publication. Uh, it's called Unlimited History, Signal of Time. This is about my step grandfather, you could see. And that's the first part of uh, Unlimited History about Iran. Um, I start, I mean, I'm also a researcher. My obsessions are painting, drawing, and researching. So that's why I just um, found a way, a language, how to talk about archives, how to talk about process and how to reflect also in, on our society, what's happening right now, and what happened in the past. So that's why I started to talk to all the old people, uh, collect oral history, and uh, I love to go to archives to research everything that people are telling me to see what is the truth or what could be, what is if I add something into a archive, what if I remove it? So it's always like this missing paper 
And I love to add things into the archive. So that's why I paint it or I draw it. For each and every uh, paper, I would say I try to find um, language. So that's how I, I try to, uh, that's like a sketch, the video, so you can see um, the images of my work. Like I'm in the studio, it looks like this. So I'm a painter. And um, yeah, so I come from Iran. I'm born there, my mother is Austrian. So I grew up with two cultures. <laughs> 1978, we had to escape from the from Khomeini and the fundamental regime to Vienna, my mother's country. So I learned all the German here. Um, so this is, I think, what really influenced me my whole life, um, losing home, finding a new one, uh, two cultures and uh, two families with their own heritage. Yeah. And continuing or just, yeah. No, no, yeah, I have, I have more questions. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what particularly interested you in this juxtaposition of your personal history with the collective history. What were you looking for when you were looking at working on these archives? Um, it started really very early in my childhood uh, when I experienced uh, the fascists in Austria. I didn't understand why they wanted me to send me home. And uh, losing home means like, um, yeah, you can't go anywhere. So you have always to find a new one. Uh, Austrian like Persian. So when I said I'm from Iran, they were fine. So I was an Aryan. So this is something I learned from old people. And I didn't understand anything. So I started to research and I started to read um, about my history, about my family. Um, I didn't trust, of course, um, stories. So that's why I went to archives to find more. And I got addicted to that. So this is how it started, the oral history to a bigger thing. To, so always when I start a project, I think, uh, takes me maybe a year, but at least it takes me four to eight years. So I never can tell you uh, how long it takes and what I'm really searching for. I write into books. That's why I start my I started my research diary. I take the book everywhere. Whatever I find, I note it. And this became also an art piece. So this is how it started. Yeah. And um... When you find, uh, so, so you basically the archives are partly things that you're created, uh, like uh, paintings, right, and writings, but it's also personal writings of your relatives, and it's also public archives, right? So uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how, like in, in more specific ways, when you, when, you, when you choose something from a public archive and from a personal archive, and then you add something from your own point of view, what, what is created in this combination? What does the viewer see? What, what do they understand about these histories? Um, the viewer, what this is, I, I need also to curate my, my archive to find the red line. So this is why when I research about Iran and when it started the constitu constitutional revolution to 1943, I was extremely interested in. Um, I found the Trans-Iranian Railway, which goes from the Persian Gulf to the Caspian Sea and tells the whole story of Iran that time about the colonialism, about oil fields, about German, the Danish, about the Second World War, of course, also the first. Uh, the Trans-Iranian Railway became like my, um, yeah, my big story. And so this is how I started and this is how I also covered my book. I, I traveled to Vancouver where my grandmother lived in exile. Also my grandfather, he was not alive then anymore. He was a senator of Iran and a writer. Uh, I asked him so many things and I collected all the pictures. Of, yeah, I took the pictures and I compared them to my archives, which the papers I found in the foreign archive, uh, a federal archive in Berlin. And I found my grandmother there and how she was unveiled. So the story was totally right. But the video was, you know, it's always a risk to, to show um, 
oral history to the public because scientists could be also used for propaganda or for a nasty reason. I need to clear it up to, to find the truth. This is what I'm searching for. And um, the truth is obviously a very slippery term um, because you know there are personal truths and then there are the the collective truths that are as you know part of a certain agenda and then there are other collective truths and so maybe it's interesting to think about you know how these truths were formed in the past and how they are formed now through the media you know through it's like a, a different way of, of trying to compose these truths but i think then and now um it's like it's like a mirroring uh, of a certain way of trying to you know, there's like the collective way of trying to experience history and then there's the, the personal way. So which is actually the truth, you know, the situated personal way or is there an absolute truth? I think there is never an absolute truth. This is why I, what I say, it's always like this between an archive and the personal truth. There is this empty space. Uh, so how is it to add something and how is it, how do you formulate uh, sentences? That's why I love to work also with researcher from different fields. And that's also why it took many years until I finished a project. It's, it's my own truth. Uh, I try to cover all sides, especially for Iran, which is very difficult. Uh, it's also very difficult for me because uh, I know Farsi. This is my culture. I love Iran. I never could go back. I'm on the blacklist because I did so many other projects. Uh, I really miss it. So it's very difficult to talk about history and to bring out the whole emotional uh, part. I used, I really used my grandmother for that. <laughs> so she's the emotional part. She's telling the story and I, I make a summary of everything. For Unlimited History, Sigmund Klein it was much more uh, emotional and difficult about Holocaust. It's about my grandfather. I also knew his mother. That was really difficult and very painful. Uh, you can use everything for propaganda in all sides for the one. It depends. It's also, these are my rights. So my books are my copyrights. And I'm very careful where I show them. Yeah. It makes me think about uh, Donna Haraway, who I'm, we didn't talk about this because I actually just thought about this now, but um, I'm just reading her situated knowledge text. And she's talking about how um, actually the personal knowledges, the, the personal experiences, the personal histories that we carry with us are in a way much more truthful than a sort of supposedly objective scientific collective truth that comes from, you know, surveillance and cameras and agendas and governments and, um, so I, I was thinking about this because in a way I think you're you're creating this sort of situated truth that is trying to um, to delve into the hidden parts of these uh, these collective truths. It's like the untold the histories, the fragmented histories. Um, yeah, and um, so so each um, unlimited history book stands by itself and it's huge projects. But in this video that you created for us, um, there are beginnings of, of connections between the two histories, the, like the two different histories. Is this something that you started working on before or did that happen like now for this conversation? Um, no, I planned it um, many years before. My step-grandfather, he, I mean, it's, I need to say step-grandfather, but he is my grandfather. He was my grandfather. He passed away three years ago. Um, we, he never told us that he was Jewish and his father died in a concentration camp. I knew his mother. She was like this grumpy old woman, never talking. When I was about 30, at least he said, okay, there is something wrong in his family. And I found, uh, because his archive was beautiful. He kept everything for us. Uh, but there was this one box written mother, father, and I was not allowed to open it. So I knew I'd have to start doing things. I knew there must be something connected to the concentration camps and to letters. It was just an instinct. So I started with the project in 1933, um, which 
it was also very interesting for Austria. We had the Austrian fascism here. So the NSDAP was forbidden in Austria, not in Germany. Uh, people in the prison were from the NSDAP and also communists like Bruno Kreisky. This is why he could escape because he was um, fine with uh, you know his enemies in the prison. So they helped him out when he was prison the second time. Yes, uh, this is also connected to my life because my our like my generation we had to deal with the Second World War. When I came to Austria, people were really bothering me with that. It's like there's nothing happened to me. My first, I have two grand grandmothers I knew, like one for my uh, grandmother, the other one for my grandfather, and they had just terrible stories. I never ever heard some nice stories from them, so this influenced me a lot. For me, Vienna was just dark and grumpy and bad. I, I really hated Vienna when I was a kid. All these things, and of course, I was discriminated for my language. I didn't know how to speak German. I had to learn German. Still, people are uh, mobbing, <laughs> like bullying me, uh, saying, yeah, this is not your mother tongue, which is ridiculous. So it has a lot to do with pain. Pain, losing the country you love, losing the language you love, trying to not forgetting the language, which easily happens when you're a kid. You learn a new one, you lose the other one. So keeping things together, hating one country, loving the other one. I had to find a way out to deal with all this uh, history and the heritage of my, of my family. I collected the uranium part, from which was always for me the nicer one. The bad part, I did another project, of course, uh, about my own work. I didn't use it right now. It's a little bit more radical, I would say, about Ahmadinejad and you know, things happened into my life. There are so many people in our, um, not, not in the family, but friends we really loved. They were shot. They killed them in the revolution, not their families, but you know, the politicians. So with all this pain, finding, lose, like searching for answers, you need to go to archives. And I'm an artist, so I need to find my own language, how to, how to express myself for, for myself. I paint my own Iran into my studio. I paint the story of my grandfather, he never told me, into my studio. And then I compare things, of course, it's the same timeline. It starts in the early of 20th century and stops 42 when Sigmund Klein was killed, 43 the Tehran conference in Iran. So this is how I compare it with these timelines. And also the geopolitical uh, part, I have the Trans-Iranian Railway for my first book in Iran, and I used a uh, timeline of Sigmund Klein, also the route because it was a Czech Jewish activist, uh, yeah, Czech Jewish activist, I would say, born in very close to Prague. He came to Vienna to work. He met my grand grandmother. Yeah, and then he was prisoned 38 to Dachau, then Buchenwald, and he was killed in Robin Street 42. So this is just weird to have so many stories in your own family. Yeah. I want to also ask you briefly about um, your participatory projects because I think they they are also related to this perception of personal testimonies. So maybe the project with the prisoners could be interesting to talk about how you also collect their personal stories and their names or their names more than their stories as a way to memorize them. You mean the prison wall now? Mm -hmm. Okay, the prison wall. Uh, yeah, that, that was a really huge project. As I say, it's like 700 square meter. It was from a high secure prison in uh, an hour away from Vienna. Uh, I, yeah, that was a commission work. I had to do something with this wall and I thought I need to paint their own history on their wall. And there was a really bad and nasty history. It's called the Kremser massacre, Kremser Hasenjagd, which means the hunting the rabbit, which is terrible. People still use it, these words. 
I was researching for the prison book for the names because the massacre was the, when the Red Army came to Austria, the prisoners could just go home because many of them were partisans or Greek soldiers. But the Nazis came from the town and they killed them with a huge massacre. And the local people hunted them as well. There were about 300 victims. People don't want to talk about it. I wanted to paint a fragment as a blueprint. Blueprint is a technique I love to use, reproducing your own writings on a new paper. I have, again, my own archive, my own paper in my studio. So the idea was to blow it up on the prison wall um, and, and to paint it on the wall. So this is what we did, it was huge and it worked out and I'm very happy with that. I tried to paint the names that you can't really read them because you don't know who really died. It's about, yeah, so 44 and 45. Probably all, but probably not. A sign, you know, it's like a kind of a monument. Thank you. Um, I think maybe it's a good time to to ask people um, from our the other participants in this conversation if they maybe want to ask you something. Um, you can turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Actually, Christophe and Nicolaus are in Jerusalem. Right now. Hello. Hi, Ramesh. Well, hey, so good to see you. Usually he's my neighbor in Vienna, it's so far. <laughs> I have a first question. <laughs> How is the, um, the artistic practice of painting um, for you personally a means uh, to deal, a therapeutic means to deal with the, the, the difficult histories? Um, that's a really good question because painting is like my heart tool that I always use. As I say, I painted my Iran into my studio. I am, um, I come from classical painting. So this is, this is my main tool. I'm very um, confident with painting. I can paint everything. I love to paint everything. So I have to paint the archive because it's always so beautiful. I enjoy like painting um, the propaganda postcards of the First World War. They were just amazing, you know, just, just to paint it and to realize it and to bring it in a new format, as you see. Um, I always find a new format and to enjoy it. I really enjoy my painting, painting it. Maybe afterwards, not that much, but I enjoy painting. <laughs> Is it what you wanted to know? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, how long? Is it a quick process? No, no. Paint? no. No, no, not really. Because it, they look quite sophisticated. Yeah. So do you need I this? Uh, do you need the time also to reflect? Do you, uh, do you research in between others? Do you paint them in one take? Are you like immersed in, in, in different, do you listen to podcasts while you're painting? Is it like, a, yes. how, how can we imagine that? When I paint, I really do my paintings for a long while, like I paint in over six months during Corona and I listen to maybe a thousand podcasts. I don't even remember like this one from six months ago. I'm not that smart. So I do all my notes all the time. Go and check this one, you know, after six months. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you're totally right. Like this, you can see on the back, like the triptych of these are the bird perspective of um, the concentration camps. And these paintings really took a long time. So it depends what I paint. When I paint landscapes, it's much faster. Uh, portraits, not that much, but of course, these kind of paintings take a long while. And there, although I didn't enjoy them that much, it's more concerned. So whatever, it's, it's, it's also depending on the mood, the light outside and where I am. 
the format, if it's big or if it's small. But the Sigmund Klein paintings, I enjoyed a lot. I didn't enjoy the drawings because I did all the blueprints of the letters of the concentration camps, like here. There's so many, like four years letters, the blueprints was terrible. And I did also all the drawings of the bookkeeping pages was also terrible. Like these are all drawings, you see? Oh my God. Like there are so many, you see? I mean, this is like crazy work. It's, um, yeah. So I totally don't enjoy this, but I need to do it because I think I'm also a conceptual artist and I need to show it. And I, of course I cannot paint the, the letters. That would be weird. So this one I could paint all the photographs. Uh, I collected the photographs of my grandfather uh, and so until 1938 when he was deported. It's also in, in interesting that it's kind of like a. Oh, sorry. Look, if you want to show you. So, you see? yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see? All right. So these are. These are Christoph, I know you're going to enjoy these ones. These are the propaganda postcards. You want what I really love to paint is this kind of painting. You see? Yeah. This is yeah. great in the movie too. Yeah. So, yeah. I love where I love questions about painting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But it's also nice, uh, Ramesh, how uh, it's interesting how your books um, are kind of a reflection of what's going on in your mind. So it's uh, it's beyond the, just the research. It's like all the processes that are very intuitive, kind of like a stream of consciousness and not just uh, the finalized product sort of thing. I work extremely chaotic. I need always to um, curate my work together to like this book. I thought I should start like a, a film, you know, it starts with my grandmother's story. So if you go through my books, you can see the timeline. Yeah. Any other questions? Stories yeah. are maybe too dark. Okay. I think Christoph and Nicolas want to ask another question. Okay. No, I, I just I wanted to remind you uh, that at the end, if anyone, if no one else is having a question, uh, call on me again, please, because I have one more. But not, I don't want to, to pose it right now. It's not so important. No, ask, okay. no, but you can. I think you are the one who has a question right now. So go ahead. <laughs> yes, it's okay. <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually more uh, a thing that it, I just reminded me uh, to a book. Uh, it's called Objectivity. It's by Lorraine Dalston and Peter Gellison, and it's fantastic uh, how they analyze the way um, an encyclopedic imagery of knowledge works. And, uh, and they have these three terms. It was uh, truth to nature, I think, was the, the style of drawing images uh, in encyclopedic atlases. And this is a very interesting, uh, and it was like up until photography was invented and fucked everything up, kind of. And then uh, also then came, first was drawing, then photography, and then the microscope, the raster electronic microscope, which uh, is a completely new way of understanding images. And this uh, painting is very similar to um, the drawing of the atlas. Mm -hmm. And I think it is extremely interesting uh, to, 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 to have this painting in the discourse about history um, as a filter to understand knowledge. It's, it's, uh, this could be a very, I have to, I have to give you the book, Ramesh, if you don't yeah, have it already. I no, I don't have it. Um, it's also like painting has, it's also an, an emotional uh, way to show work and history. When you come to my exhibition, I really take care of this place and I work also with sound and room, depend where I show. I think it's all very important to, to have not like this brutal images. I really avoid them. I mean, I have projects where I didn't, but for these ones. And paintings has something, so people 
stay there and really watch paintings. I enjoy watching them, mm. watching my paintings. Yeah. Yeah. But, so as you say about uh i also love to draw an index like see i found all the tools of my of my grandfather of my grand grandfather he was a tinsmith my god i can show you also use tools christoph you have to come to my studio so i draw yep. all them in a book yeah you saw it also in, in the video you came later so you didn't see it maybe so you not see their it? fault but they will see it afterwards <laughs> <laughs> this is my these are my that's the index of the tools and i use the tools also as an object for when i show my work they're also here so christoph you're very welcome to come over yes i will in one month <laughs> yeah, okay. and maybe. But, uh, thanks christoph also for uh for opening up the you know the subject of photography because it's it also connects to the notion that we spoke about before about this uh, subjectivization, which I don't think it's a word, but anyway, making history more subjective, because you know our painting and drawing is obviously perceived as more subjective than photography, like in relation to also to what Christoph said, it's an interesting choice to to paint these histories rather than only showing the. It's like another layer of uh, of personalization and subjectivity a new language for me so this is how i try to find um, ways to draw an archive with blueprints or here you see here are the collages and the charcoal so yeah these are all series of different uh, papers or photographs any other questions <laughs> Nicolaus, are you you're trying to say something? I can unmute you. Okay, you're unmuted. Okay, okay. No, I, I found it very interesting this this uh, and this emancipation actually, like this taking over of, of this of the images, which are like especially when we're we're talking about the soldier is totally king to my to my eyes um, that yeah I, I found it a, a very interesting way of, of taking over these this images which are so so very strong um, and which are very hard to feel like this, this huge history you're somehow confronted with so, um, and I found it a very subtle way to to somehow um, be find the possibility to move within this, this history and not be silent by, by this, this immense um, horror which is in it. Um, I, I was just wondering if I read this correctly, like oh, what, what this part of emancipation, if this is a motive of you for painting these images? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so, because it's also a big responsibility to work with archives and how to draw or paint it. I, I totally don't enjoy art, uh, which is like too didactic, you know? And uh, to, I think the best way to work with an archive is to be totally free in your mind. To say, okay, it's, it's up to you. You're the artist. You have like an amount big archive in front of you. You can stick into the archive. You can die in that or you just take out what you enjoy and what you like. And even if it's painful, just do something with it. You are the artist, so it's your own responsibility how you deal with it. At least I'm free because I think if it's not good, I just throw it away. Right? So I, is it that what you mean to be kind of? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah kind of, but, but also it's like this, um... Yeah, of course, it's the freedom to, to throw it away. Sure, but also this taking over, like somehow you're taking over this these yeah, images, okay. also this this way of showing soldiers or the perspectives and so on, and you're, no, you're remodeling it. Yeah, that's that's totally true. Yeah, but I I can't think about that before I work or these things. I it's good that we talk about after my publication. But you're right; it's a new perspective. <laughs> my thing yes you're right yeah 
Yeah. Now I see. It's, it's really great what you say. I have to think about that. I actually never thought about that in this way. I like the Thanks. word participation for this. Yeah. Thanks, Nicolas. And Martin has a question. Hi, Martin. Yes. Uh, um, hi, Ramesh. <laughs> I'm talking to you from Braunschweig now. Um, so my question is also about uh, the autonomy of arts and especially in the context of painting. So I'd like to ask you if, you if your paintings or your drawings are just abstractions and kind of translating uh, uh, a photo or archive material into an artistic work. Uh, is, it, is it just a copy of, of the of the image or do you sometimes add something or take something away um, to actually contextualize it differently? Um, yeah, that's a really amazing, great question. I do add something like, as you see uh, the propaganda postcards, like again, can I just move? It's so much easier to show, right? I go with this, like, this is a propaganda postcard, yeah? And you see the blue print on it? That's the writings from the backside. So I add it. Or here, when you see, uh, can you see this? It's um, the bird perspective of Ravensbrück. And I add the barracks where Sigmund Klein uh, was captured, right? So I do. I need to add something also for myself. As I said, I, I work in research diaries, remember, to remember the, my own reality and to also to decide what do I want to paint. For my Iran project, I needed to paint the Trans-Iranian railway because I cannot travel to Iran anymore. So I use Google Earth and the coordinates, you see, so I found all the coordinates. This is part of my research diary. And here I found the images for it and photographs and I painted and I add uh, the coordinates on that. So when you go to the coordinates, you find this image. So it's super plakative, <laughs> but I just enjoy doing that. And I also like to work with uh, uh, writings. May I add uh, one sentence? Um, what I meant uh, was this, but also uh, because you said you're searching for truth in a way, and I liked it very much, uh, this attempt to do this artistically. And my question was also because if you see an, a photo, of course, it also doesn't show reality. It also, we all know, shows only a part of reality. So when you paint, maybe you can add something or take something away to come closer uh, to represent the truth with that image. So that was also the, the question uh, that was related to that too. Um, yeah, uh, usually when I paint from photographs is I also have the 9-11 project. We didn't talk about it. I paint all the portraits of the victims 9-11. I have almost 1000. So I have to, and this is like my life project, very silent, like my own silent project. And uh, it's more about because I have one photograph of the tribute sites, of the victims, and I need to paint from this photograph. So I need to add sometimes colors because the photograph is pixel. So I need to create a new room for this portrait. And I think this fits more to my to that what you are talking about as to, to my unlimited history project is more the portrait where I really need to add sometimes shadow or another color of the background or to bring it to you. And I never can say if the portrait is really this person because I don't know it. So it's my own interpretation of this photograph. I think this fits more to this other project. And you see these are like all, uh, these boxes are all, the 9-11 paintings, you see? So here, it's my painted archive. 
and here is the other archive. So my studio is really stick with all these images everywhere. Yeah, is it okay? Good. Thank you, Martin. Um, any more questions? Ramesh, do you have anything uh, else you want to say or to add or? I don't know. I mean, there are so many projects I do, so I, I think it's enough because people are going to be maybe confused. And... <laughs> OK, yeah. well, thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. And uh, you are all welcome to the next date with an artist with uh, Martin Kren and Andrea Hovin, who are here with us as well on the 18th, yeah. same time. Um, and thanks again to the Austrian Cultural Forum and thank you to the Art Cube Artist Studios team who are uh, amazing and uh, patient and smart and uh, I love them. And thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.